Mark chapter 8. We'll begin reading at uh, verse number 22. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught, or do you see anything? What do you see? And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. And after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. And he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, Neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. Let's pray together. Father, we love you this morning and the music has been good. The fellowship is very sweet. And Lord, now we place our attention upon the word of God because we know it's not only the power unto salvation, but it is also the directive for the Christian's life once he's saved. I pray you'd help us to see this morning. Give us spiritual sight that we may see into the Word of God. Give us a yearning in our heart to know Jesus better. We'll thank you for all of that in Jesus' name. Amen. I've had friends, and you probably have too, over the years. You, you meet somebody and you get a first impression, right? And I've met a few people where I thought, boy, that person is a snob. Or he's conceited. Or she's just mean. Or you make some judgment about them based on your first impression. <laughs> and sometimes they can be very wrong. And later on, I've got to know some of those people that I thought I knew. And after I got to know them, I found out they had a really tender heart. They really loved the Lord. And it was just their mannerisms might have been different than I was accustomed to. And I found out they were really, really great people. And... My wife and I now will be married 47 years in November. That's a long time. Uh, 1976 when we got married. And it was a bicentennial year. That's the reason I can always remember it. November the 2nd. And so we've been around each other for a long time. You ever hear anybody say, boy, when you've been married a long time, you... you uh, you almost think like each other. You can, tell, you can almost finish a sentence when the other person starts. And sometimes my wife does that. Or you know what each other's thinking. And they say even sometimes you even get to look like each other. That's probably a scary thought for my wife. <clears throat> we can know people sort of. And after we get to know more about them, we really see down inside their heart, know what they're really like. And that's what I want to talk to you about today concerning Jesus. Do we know him as well as we should? Have we arrived at the point where there's nothing left for us to learn about him? Have you been saved a long time and you say, boy... I didn't realize I didn't know so much about him until I keep reading and reading. And sometimes in the very same scripture, I see things about him that I didn't recognize before. Christians are at different stages in their born-again life. And sometimes you have just been saved for a short while and you think, boy, I, I see Jesus and so much different light than I saw him before I got saved. And that's usually true. But then after you've been saved for a few years, you see him again and again and again. And you begin to see him more clearly. Not quite arriving, but more clearly. 
I want you to see, I'm going to preach kind of backwards to what I usually do. I usually, if I've got three or four points in my message, I'll usually, the whole message is nearly on point number one. <laughs> and then the, the last two or three points, I've got, a, I've got a bam, 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 and conclusion, and we're done. This morning, I'm going to go about it backwards, I think. So I'm going to show you some, four things about this story, this narrative about the blind man that Jesus encountered at Bethsaida, what happened, and how we can see how he saw better. First of all, notice the town. Let's talk about the town. I, I think it's good that we get to know these, these Bible stories. Man, it's more than just a story. I mean, we read these to our children and our grandchildren when they're little, and, and we ought to. But sometimes, uh, at first, they just see it as a story, almost like a fairy tale or something related from your past. And they don't see all the deep truths that's in it. And so sometimes we've grown up that way, or at least since we've been saved, and we see these stories and we just look at the surface of them and don't think very deeply down into them and sink our roots down and see what's all involved in this story. Notice the town, first of all. There was two Bethsaidas. This Bethsaida is on the northeast shore of the Sea of Galilee, where... The Jordan River runs in from the north into the top of the Sea of Galilee. And this Bethsaida was on the, the top of that lake. It was uh, on the eastern shore of the Jordan River, right at the lake or the sea. And it was called Julia because it had been known as Bethsaida by the Jews for quite some time. But when Philip the Tetrarch uh, was ruling in that district, he renamed the town after Caesar Augustus's daughter, Julia. And so they call it, and, and if you read about this town in some of your uh, uh, historical books, you'll find that they call it Bethsaida Julia, dash between them. Well, the Romans would probably call it, just call it Julia in honor of Augustus. The Jews called it Bethsaida. And so there was two Bethsaidas. The other one was on the other, side of the, on the other side of the lake. And this one is at the top, northeast. And Matthew 11, uh, 11, 21 shows us something about Bethsaida. This place, Jesus visited frequently. But there's something about this place that stands out. And that was that Jesus had been there a number of times and they had rejected him. Here's what it says in Matthew eleven twenty one. 21. Jesus pronounced a woe upon them. When Jesus says woe, it's serious. He says, woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. So Jesus had already said, I've been in Bethsaida a number of times. I've tried to speak to you people, and, and a few responded, but for... A, for the city as a whole, you just said, no, you don't want to know any more about me. And so he wasn't going back there anymore, but he returned on this particular day in our text. But if he'd already pronounced a woe upon them, and they're goners, so why is he coming back? Well, we'll see more about that in a little while. The, the blind man in our in our text that we read a little while ago, the, the blind man, when Jesus encounters him, the first thing he does is what? He takes him to these people. It doesn't say who they are. It just says they brought to him a blind man. We assume it's some of the, a few of the city folks that want to see another miracle out of Jesus. And so they bring him, the blind man, to Jesus. And Jesus takes him by the hand. And the Bible says he, they, he, he led him out of the city. He's going to get him out of that place. Hey, these are rejectors. Remember when uh, Jesus was about to raise that dead girl back to life? The Bible says he put them all out of the room. He didn't want the unbelievers interfering and trying to capture the attention of what he was really trying to do. And so he led the blind man out of town to get him away from those people into a private place. Sometimes when Jesus wants to talk to people on a close basis... He'll lead you out from the crowd. And as you dedicate your life to Him, your days of going along with the crowd, Jesus wants that to be done, finished. 
He leads them out. So he led this man out. And this is why, notice in the last part of our, our text, the very last verse that we read, in verse number 26, it says, after he had done the healing, it says, and he, he sent him away. This is after he's restored his vision. It says, and he sent him away to go to his house, saying, neither go into the town, nor tell it to any in the town. So this is why Jesus led him out of the town, and when he healed him, he said, now don't go back over there, you go home. Those people won't listen to you over there. Are you listening? He said, those people won't listen to you. If you go tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, they're not going to listen. Go back to your home and tell your family, tell your neighbors and tell your friends, tell those who will listen. You ever talk to somebody about the Lord and they didn't want to hear it? <laughs> well, look, you can just keep on talking and they might even pray a prayer with you to get you off their front porch, <laughs> out of their living room. But did it do anything for them? No, if they didn't want to hear you, you've wasted your breath. Now, we don't know about who's going to listen and who's not, so everybody probably deserves a shot, but Jesus already gave those people a shot a number of times. He led him out of the town, and he said, now don't go back in there. You go home, and you tell the people who are willing to listen. That's the town. Now let's talk about the man, the blind man. Number two, the blind man. He was not born blind, because remember, he says... When Jesus said, do you, do you see aught or do you see anything? Verse 24, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. The blind man had not been born blind or he wouldn't know what trees look like. <laughs> so evidently he had been able to see during his lifetime at some point. You see what I mean about getting into these stories just a little bit deeper? You begin to see some things you didn't see before. I'd really never thought about that before, but this man must have been able to see at one point or he wouldn't be able to even recognize a tree, even if it's a blurry tree. And he wouldn't know what walking looked like or what a tree or a man that resembles a tree would look like walking. Evidently, he didn't live in Bethsaida either. We're talking about the man now. He didn't live in Bethsaida because Jesus said, don't go back in that town, go home. So his home wasn't in town. So he lived somewhere else, probably nearby. He must go immediately to his own home. Now notice the third thing, the healing itself, the healing that took place. This is unusual. Well, I mean, it's unusual. How many of you would like to have somebody spit in your face to get you healed? <laughs> if you're blind, I guess I'd put up with it. <laughs> it says Jesus spit on his eyes. Well, that's a little bit unique, isn't it? <laughs> Some people come to church here and if they sit on that front row, see, that's why we can't get hardly anybody but Connor and his wife sit on the front row. They don't want to get spit on. Right. <laughs> I love spit row, man. That's where I want everybody to sit. Uh, <laughs> you won't find many in a Baptist church, but that's where, that's where I like to see them sit. <laughs> the healing. Well, it was unusual. It says in verse number 23, And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes, he put his hands upon him and asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up. Hey, you know, looking up always helps. <laughs> looking up always helps. If you look around, you might be discouraged, you might be depressed. Might be angry. When you get that way, it's probably a good idea just to look up because Jesus will never disappoint. I'm talking about knowing him better. Knowing him better. So he looked up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. Now here's what else is really unique about this healing itself. Most of the places where Jesus healed people, he just spoke and bam, it was done. But here, just one or two other places in the whole Bible where he healed somebody that it was done in a progression, steps, gradually. And so here, do you think Jesus was lacking power to heal him all at once? No, if you know Jesus very well, you know he could do it all at one time if he wanted to. He did it most of the time that way. But here he decided to heal this man gradually, progressively. 
First he sees men walking. First he can't see anybody, anything. He's blind as a bat. And then Jesus spits on his eyes and he says, now what do you see? He says, well, I see people walking like, looks like trees walking, really blurred, you know. And Jesus said, okay. And so he put his hands on him and then he said, now what do you see? He said, now I see everybody clearly. A gradual thing. That was what made it unusual. Maybe he was led, maybe this man was led to be, have the healing performed on him. Maybe he was led into solitude, not just because he wanted to get him out of the town around the unbelievers, the Christ rejectors, but maybe he wanted to lead the man out of town as sort of a spiritual test. You know, the Lord will sometimes lead you into darkness. <laughs> How many of you know that? You ever been in a dark spot in your Christian life? Sometimes He will lead you into a dark place. Sometimes He will lead you into a solitary place. Sometimes He will do that as a test to see how much you know Him, how much you trust Him, how much you're going to place your confidence in Him. So when He leads you into a solitary place, don't curse the darkness. Understand that this might be just where God led you. When when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt, the Bible says God led them in a way that was roundabout to the Red Sea and then let them get backed up against the sea and Pharaoh's armies were coming. That looks like, what? did the Lord make a mistake here? Man, I thought he was getting us out of this place. And here comes the Egyptians. God put them there for a purpose, to test their faith and to show them his power. And God may want to do the same thing with us from time to time. Now that's three of my points. See, I told you I was going fast. Now I'm down to the fourth and last point. Ah, oh, but you remember I said the last point was the long point. The fourth point. This is the one you don't see until you really look deeply and think about it. We saw the town. We saw the man. We saw the healing. Now we see the silent classroom. Well, who are the students? Ah, this is where we go just a little bit further into the story, and we have to see the context both before and after this story for it to really make enough sense to us to grasp. <clears throat> have you ever read this before and wondered, why did Jesus go back to Bethsaida when he had already pronounced a woe on them? Why did he lead the man out of the city and why did Jesus heal him in a progressive fashion instead of all at once? Why does all this, is that there just as a filler in the Bible to take up space on a page? I don't think there's a single word in the Bible that's there as a filler, do you? All of it, every word of God, it all proceeds out of the mouth of God and he's got a purpose. His ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. So let's do our best to think at least a little bit higher and we'll see what we can learn about this silent classroom. The disciples, this will make sense to you in a little while, just stick with me. The disciples are seeing an illustration in this blind man of themselves. They were blind, and as we sing the song sometimes, once I was blind, but now I see. Well, many times when we get saved, we see, but we see men walking as trees. We see through a glass darkly. We see, and then we see more. And gradually, the vision becomes more clear than it was before. Here's what one Bible teacher said. <clears throat> Mark uses the account of the opening of the blind man's eyes to symbolize and anticipate the opening of the understanding of the disciples as to the true nature and messiahship of Jesus. Here are these disciples. Are they not with him? Have they not been traveling with Jesus? Do they not know him? <laughs> oh, they don't know a lot about him. 
In fact, even, even later than this, you can see when he's telling them about, he's going to the cross. He said, I've got to, I've got to die at the hands of wicked men and then I'm going to rise from the dead three days later and Peter rebukes him, says, not so, Lord, you're not going to do that. What did Jesus say to him? Get thee behind me, Satan. They didn't understand his plan. He explained the gospel to them, how he's going to die on the cross. Now he's going to, it, it happens several times. And they don't understand the gospel. And the, in fact, the narrator of the scripture says, and they understood none of these things. So how well do they know him? Well, not very well at this point. To understand the impact and the intent of the blind man's healing, we have to look at the context a little closer. Let's go back to Mark 8, 14, in the same chapter. In verse number 14, now, now keep in mind, <clears throat> Jesus is traveling with his disciples. They've been on the other side of Galilee. Now they're in the boat headed to uh, Bethsaida. They're zigzagging diagonally across the sea. Verse 14, Now the disciples had forgotten to take bread, neither had they in the ship with them more than one loaf. And he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they reasoned. Okay, now here's where we sometimes get faulty. When we begin to reason. Now reason is a good thing, but reasoning can take you in the wrong direction too if you don't know Jesus very well. It says, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have no bread. And when Jesus knew it, he saith unto them, Why reason ye, because ye have no bread? Perceive ye not yet, neither understand. So see, they didn't understand. Have ye your heart yet hardened? Having eyes, see ye not? And having ears, hear ye not? And do you not remember? He said, Jesus goes back. They're, they're saying, well, he, he's getting on to us because we didn't bring enough bread with us. We got one loaf and now he's mad because we didn't bring the bread. And they didn't know Jesus very well because he says in verse 19, do you not remember when I break the five loaves among 5,000, how many baskets full of fragments you took up? Now look, they say, they say unto him, twelve. See, they, they've got a pretty good memory about what happened on the surface, what happened that's just a minor detail. Twelve baskets, yeah, they remember that. They remember the 5,000 getting fed. And when the seven among the 4,000, how many basket full of fragments you took up? And they said seven. See, boy, they remember some of these details on the surface. Verse 21, and he said unto them, how is it that you do not understand? The disciples had missed the meaning. See, when they're in the boat, they're going across Galilee and Jesus tells them, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now we know that leaven in the Bible is generally a picture of sin. And so he's saying, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. The Pharisees were hypocrites who pretended to love God, but they denied God with their life. And they rejected Christ. He said, beware of this doctrine, the sinful doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Herodians. They were kind of a political party. And uh, just to nail down this coffin lid, <laughs> better not put all your trust in the political parties. <laughs> Even the one you like the best may fail you. <laughs> Have we ever seen that before? I'm not saying don't vote. You ought to vote. It's your moral responsibility. I'm not saying you ought to not know the news. You ought to. You ought to know what's going on. And, and vote for the least evil one of the group. <laughs> so yeah, that's... But don't fall victim to their way of thinking, thinking this is, this is where it's at, man. If we just elect the right guy in the White House, everything will be cool. No, you're probably not going to get a prophet Elijah or a Moses or a Jesus in the White House. So our hope lies somewhere else. Not in the Herodians, not in the Pharisees. They missed it. Jesus is trying to teach them a spiritual lesson. And they say, 
Well, he's getting on to us because we didn't bring the bread. They're thinking about supplying the needs of the stomach. That wasn't, that wasn't what Jesus was talking about at all. I think if we could read the Greek, it probably says, Disciples, you bunch of dodos, <laughs> not heads. They'd missed the meaning of the warning about the Pharisees and the, in the boat as they're coming to Bethsaida. The spiritual application was way more important than the surface meaning of what bread is. Man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. We have to get deeper than just the temporal things, the material things, the things that runs on everybody's mind. We have to know Jesus on a more spiritual basis than just hoping he'll supply our food next week (laughs) or something more important than your next meal. I mean, there's people come to church on Sunday (laughs) and they're thinking, when will that preacher get done? Man, I'm looking forward to roast beef and mashed potatoes. Now, if you can afford roast beef, I want to go home with you. (laughs) I looked at one in the grocery store a few days ago, like $27, and I'm thinking, wow, that thing, you could just nearly put it on a hamburger bun. Looks like it'll be a while before I have another roast. <laughs> Hand me that pork. <laughs> Chicken. Not tofu, though. That'll make men feminine. <laughs> what did disappoint Jesus so much about the disciples' response in the boat? Because they weren't progressing very much spiritually. They knew Jesus, they were with Jesus. And they had a measure of trust in Jesus, but it didn't go very deep. And they couldn't think very deep. And if all we're looking for in life is just surface applications, we'll never get very far towards growing in Christ. The Bible says, Desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. And in the Hebrews it says that that we ought to be able to assimilate more than just milk, but we ought to desire the meat that comes with maturity. And so when a Christian, when a Christian realizes, hey, I'm still in the place I was the day I got saved. I've been saved for months or years and and I don't seem to know any more than I did. What is wrong? Are we anemic? That's what this story is addressing. They weren't advancing. They were close to Jesus in the physical sense, but they weren't experiencing the spiritual fulfillment, they didn't understand his divine nature completely here. They didn't understand his messiahship. They didn't understand his lordship. They just saw him as a really great guy. But that's about as far as they're getting. Imagine a man, imagine a man who's physically close to his wife. I mean, it's hard to be husband and wife and not be, you know, in the same proximity. At least I hope you are. But imagine a man is living in close proximity and physical contact with his wife, but there's no emotional connection. He doesn't know what makes her tick. I saw a picture, a meme on, on the Internet a while back, and it showed a, a book that had just been published uh, what every man needs to know about women. And there's a book that was one book about this tall. <laughs> and that was just first chapter. But there, a husband ought to know something about his wife, don't you think? I mean, what, what are her desires? What does she love? What is her background? What are her dreams for the future? What does she really like? What does she want from me? What does she need? How can I meet her needs? But a man, just imagine a man doesn't know anything about his wife's heart at all. They're just living in the same house. All he's, he's just down to business about everything. I mean, he, he's interested in the meals being prepared. and I mean, he likes the fact that she keeps a clean house. And he's got iron clothes to wear. Laundry's done. He likes the daily routine that she goes through, but just no real closeness. The only time he's very close to her is when 
he's waking up in the morning. He leans over the bed and whispers in her ear, Isn't it about time for you to fix breakfast? (laughs) I know what you were thinking. Jesus wants more from his disciples than just a down-to-business routine. Jesus wants more from his disciples than just knowing, just being able to quote the Romans road to a person that you think needs to hear it. God wants something more out of us than just to repeat a long prayer list and our heart's not in it. Jesus wants more from his disciples than a mechanical obedience. Obedience, yes. But a mechanical obedience without an attachment to the heart? If that's all we've got, we're not very closely connected with him. And we may be as bad as that husband who's just worried about the next meal. These disciples weren't hostile to Jesus. They were not hostile. They cared about Jesus, but they just didn't know much about him. They weren't hostile like the Pharisees were hostile. They could see Jesus better than the Pharisees could. But let's fast forward in that same chapter now to verse 27. Chapter 8, verse 27. We're looking for the context surrounding this narrative about the blind man. In Mark 8, 27, it says, And Jesus went out. Now, they've left. They're just now leaving Bethsaida, and they're going somewhere else. You with me? They're leaving Bethsaida. They're going somewhere else. Right out of the chute, it says in verse 27, And Jesus went out and his disciples. See, there's your silent classroom. They were with him in the boat when he, just before he landed at Bethsaida. They're with him at the healing of the blind man. And now it picks up the story again. They move out of Bethsaida going somewhere else. And the disciples are still with him. So we've got this silent classroom. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked them. By the way, remember, he's not in town right now. He's out in a quiet place. And that solitude surrounding. And he asked them, by the way, his disciples. This is right after the healing of the blind man. Stay with me. Connect the dots. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom? Do men say that I am? Ah, there's the question. Who do they say I am? I'm talking about the identity of Jesus. What is his real person? What is his real nature? Who is he? And they answered, verse 28, John the Baptist, but some say Elias, and others say one of the prophets. Now look at verse 29. And he saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? Do you get the picture now? Here's these disciples back there in the boat going to Bethsaida. They've got, they've got just a blurry vision as men walking as trees. They get there and Jesus gives them a clear life illustration of the progressive healing of the blind man. Blurry vision, then clear vision. And now they're leaving Bethsaida, and he's saying, by the way, guys, <clears throat> who do they say I am? Well, they say this, and they say that. Now, yeah, but who do you say I am? Now he's nailing it down. In other words, did you get the illustration, disciples, <laughs> that I just showed you back there in Bethsaida about the blind man? Did you get it? Last part of verse 29, And Peter answereth, answereth and saith unto him, Thou art the Christ. And he charged them that they should tell no no man of him. Thou art the Christ. Okay, good, Peter. Now you're beginning to see a little more clearly. Good, Peter. You saw the illustration back there. Now you can see more about who I am. Jesus apparently had already turned away from those people at Bethsaida and was not willing to go back and waste time on them anymore. And now he's telling 
Peter and the other disciples. Now you're seeing them a little more clearly. And just like I told the blind man, don't go back into town and waste your time there. Go to somebody that's willing to hear. And he said, now, don't go and, he's telling the disciples, don't, don't go and tell the people what you just learned. Why not tell them? Because they're the ones that rejected him. No use wasting time on them. Now later he's going to tell them, go ye unto all the world. You see, they were still wandering in darkness. They could see men walking as trees, but they need to see beyond the trees. It's a scary thing to be in darkness. <laughs> I was making coffee this morning. I, I've been waking up at 4.30 every morning. I don't know why. This is crazy. I don't like to wake up early. I wake up at 4.30 and I lay in the bed for about an hour, try to go back to sleep. Been happening all week. Try to go back to sleep for a little while. I'm not one of those guys. I've heard other preachers say, man, I get up at 3 o'clock every morning and pray for four hours and then, and then read my Bible for four hours and I go out and witness for 16 hours. And I'm wondering, when does this guy sleep? <laughs> and when does he tell the truth? <laughs> well, I was making coffee. I, I got up 5.30. I thought, well, hours passed. I'm still not going back to sleep. Might as well get up. I can do something a little more valuable than my time as I just lay here. And uh, so I got to make my coffee. Now, that's a valuable thing to do, making coffee. I've got a pot of boiling water. I've just started to bloom my, my uh, pour-over cone. Bl the coffee grounds are in there. They're dry. I'm just starting to pour a little bit of hot water over it to make it bloom. Then you wait about 30 seconds and pour the rest of it in and make a nice mug of coffee, flavorful. I mean, this is the elixir for the soul we're talking about. And so just poured that first round, and I heard something go, bang, thump. Whoa. I look around, my wife, she slips up on me sometimes early in the morning and scares me. I'm about ready to turn around and say, what are you doing, woman? And she wasn't there. And I looked, and the bedroom door was still shut. And there's no light coming under the door. Well, she's not up. Wait, she's the only one in the house. <laughs> What's going on here? So I'm trying to not ignore my coffee. I mean, I got boiling water and I already got it bloomed. I, I'm looking over my shoulder and pouring the rest of that water. Who's in the house with me? <laughs> and so I got the rest of my water poured in. Before I even drank any of it, I, sit, I took that boiling pot of water with me and looked through the house. <laughs> it's the only weapon I've got. I'm thinking, if this, is a tra if this is an intruder, man, I don't have my gun with me. I don't have a pocket knife. I don't know what I'll do. I'll throw the boiling water on him. <laughs> and so I'm going through the house. I don't find anything that's fallen off the wall. I don't see any brooms that's been knocked over and no closet rods that are fallen. I have no idea to this hour what that sound was. My hypothesis is that the dog out on the back porch must have saw a cat or something and he ran across the deck and maybe knocked something over when he was running. I don't know. I still don't know. I just looked enough to know that nobody's in the house so I can drink my coffee in peace. <laughs> it's a scary thing to be in the dark. Job mentioned darkness. You remember the trials that Job went through? 24 times in the book of Job he mentions darkness. Some of you may be in a place of darkness. It's a scary thing to be in a place of darkness. When my wife and I lived at Sydney and Aaron was just a baby. <clears throat> we were laying in the bed. We didn't have uh, air conditioning turned on. It was a fairly cool time of the year, and so we had our bedroom window open. Our headboard was right up against that window, and in the middle of the night, my wife punched me and whispered and said, there's somebody at our window. I said, woman, we live out here on 28 acres. There's no, we, our closest neighbor is a half mile away. There's nobody here. She said, oh, listen, listen, you can hear him breathing. And sure enough, I listened and you could hear it right at the screen over our window, and you could hear it going, <sighs> and I got scared. I thought, there's a serial killer outside our window. So I thought, I don't have a gun, I don't have a knife, I don't have, man, all I've got is my fist and my voice. Maybe I can scare him away. And so I decided what I'd do, and I jumped up in the bed and spun around and said, hey! <laughs> I thought I'd scare him away. And there's a big old horse standing there looking in our window. <laughs> he scared me more than I scared him. <laughs> the dark can be kind of scary. And when we're walking in darkness, 
not knowing who Jesus is, not knowing what he can do, not knowing how he loves you and he wants the best for your life. You may think he is a tyrant with a club looking to beat you over the head and whip you into submission. He wants you to love, he wants you to love him enough that you'll be in submission. Why do you obey him in the first place? He did say, Jesus did say, listen, don't get it wrong. I'm not of this crowd, this extreme grace crowd that says, well, you can just do anything you want to do and Jesus is okay with it. No. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Why do you keep his commandments? Why do you obey him? Why do you seek his will? Why do you want to please him? Because he wants you to love him. Do it out of love. You know what? Parents and grandparents, we can, we can take those little toddlers and those little kids and, and we can make them deathly afraid of us and children do get abused, physically abused. But if they love you and you teach them to love you and if they ought to obey you because they love you and they know you love them, they'll want to obey you for the right reason. They ought to obey some of you parents still need to learn that lesson. It's the big people in the house that's in charge. <laughs> it's not the little bitty guys. I saw a kid in a store just a week or so ago. I see it all the time. You do too. I saw a little fellow. I mean, he's in a stroller or a carriage, whatever you call those things. <laughs> they changed the names of them since I was little. <laughs> he was. They were at the checkout stand, and this little guy sitting in that baby stroller and he's screaming and having a fit and man he's yelling and he's having he's having a spell I mean he's having a he's having a nervous breakdown and the parents the mother's standing there she's not looking at him she's looking over here at something on the conveyor belt and, and the dad he's just there with his hands in his pocket looking around smiling as though nothing are going on and the whole store is upset because this one kid's in control of 5,000 square feet of floor space I'm thinking, should I walk over and tell him, sir, I can tell you how to cure this problem. <laughs> I could have told him too, but he was bigger than I was, so I decided not to tell him. It's scary to be in the dark. It's scary not to know Jesus the way we should. The disciples in the boat were concerned about material things, Bread. They didn't get it that Jesus was speaking spiritually. Mary and Martha invited Jesus over to their place for a meal. Martha scurrying about. Thank God for women that, that work. <laughs> My wife said if it wasn't for Martha, that crowd would have gone hungry. <laughs> but Mary came and sat at the feet of Jesus. Martha's still sticking with the kitchen, man. She's, she's cooking and she's washing dishes and she's slicing onions and tossing the burgers and whatever else they're doing. And, but the Bible says Mary chose the better part. It's good to keep a clean house. It's good to cook and clean and take care of the kids. But that doesn't take the place of a close relationship with Jesus knowing him intimately, knowing what makes him tick, knowing what he desires from you. Sometimes people at salvation get overwhelmed with the new vision that they've got. And sometimes they can only stand bite-sized increases in that vision, kind of like these disciples. But we can't substitute, look, we can't substitute a really long prayer list and we read through it like we're reading a phone book with a heart without being attached. That doesn't take the place of a close walk with Jesus. A long list of do's and don'ts. I said Jesus expects obedience. But if all you're living on and all of your Christianity is just surface obedience to laws and rules and regulations, you don't have a very close relationship with Jesus. Church attendance without a desire to hear and learn more about Him and to sing praises to Him and to meet with Him and worship Him with God's people. If your church attendance is just so the neighbors know you went to church, then that doesn't take the place of 
of a loving relationship with Jesus. Should you go to church? Yeah, you should. But do it for the right reason. Religious talk. Religious talk. A lot of people talk a good religion. But if that religious talk doesn't amount to what we're doing in real daily life, it's practically worthless. Soul winning. Should we try to evangelize the lost? Absolutely. But if all we're doing is putting a check mark, we witness so we can put a check mark beside the, our list of people we witness to and the ones that prayed, prayed to prayer. That's all we're doing. We're missing the point of a close relationship with Jesus Christ. He wants us to witness because we love Him and we want to see them saved and stay out of hell and enjoy heaven. Academic knowledge of Jesus rather than an intimate relationship, that misses the point too. I know people that can quote verses. I know people that's got a much deeper knowledge of the Bible than I do. But boy, you'd wonder if they even know Jesus the way they act. Church house religion that ignores daily living is not very valuable. So what do we do? Let me, let me end with this. What do we do? Give the word full authority in your life. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 through 9, I won't read it for sake of time, but it says basically that everything that the Christian needs is contained in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Hey, disciples, why did you, why did you not understand what Jesus was saying in that boat before you got there to see the blind man healed? The reason they didn't understand is because they didn't know him well enough. And he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 that we have everything wrapped up in Jesus. All we have to know is him. Now there's a lot of other things to know in the world. Like how to brew coffee, play golf. But none of it measures up to knowing Jesus. So how do we view this word? Does, let me ask you a question. Does the word, when the word is revealed, when you read it or hear it preached or taught, does it change your life? Is it a life-changing word to you? Or does it kind of do like the disciples, go in one ear and out the other? Let the word give you clarity on the person of Jesus and not preconceived notions that you heard from Dr. Smellfungus or somebody else. Understand that the real Jesus is the Jesus of the Bible. Sometimes I hear people say, say, well, this, you know, this thing of premarital sex and and the prohibition against alcohol and drugs and all that, that, that doesn't count anymore. You know, Jesus is just he's he's the Jesus of grace. Well, he is a Jesus of grace and he will save you, but it doesn't mean for you to go back to that way of life. He means for you to be different, that the word is like a medicine. Heals your inner being. He wants obedience, yes. But he wants your love even more. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you'd bless us as we come to this invitation time. I pray that if there's Christians, Lord, that don't have a clear view of who you are, what you want, and your will for their life, I pray that you'd give them a desire in their heart this morning just to know you better. And Lord, for the one who's not saved, help them, Lord, to understand that the death and the burial and resurrection of Jesus is the only thing that counts for salvation. It's not by good works. It's not by the things we do and say. But it's believing that Jesus died on a cross to pay for our sins in our place. And by trusting in Him and the work He finished on the cross of Calvary, by placing their faith in Him, they can have full salvation. I pray that you'd help us to come to those conclusions this morning. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm asking you to stand. If